similarities with my work. So to briefly introduce like how I got into poetry, um, basically uh, I'm Somali, so I come from a culture or many cultures that have like that has an oral tradition already. Um, and poets are kind of held in very high esteem. So if there's like a political debate or if there's a war in the past, um, there would there would be a poet that like would read poetry and, and whoever and it'd be like a slam kind of and whoever was the best would win. Um, yeah. And so I guess I wanted to become closer to my mother tongue. Um, I was introduced to Somali poetry by my dad. And luckily I, I do know, I am actually quite good at speaking Somali, which is, um, it's not this, I mean, that's not usual for people in the diaspora, but I think, I think it's because I wanted to develop that relationship more. So um, in the work that I've been making recently, um, it always kind of revolves around my grandfather who passed away a few years ago. Um, before we got the, before I got the chance to know him really, so I think, yeah, and um, and I think most recently what I've been working on is like a collaborative project with two other Somali artists um, in which we like interviewed Somali elders and then created like a soundscape and I created some poetry from that um, and that was really awesome because I think yeah, I'm really interested in like archiving people, especially at a time like this. So I'm going to read one of the poems that I wrote from that and also read a few more. Okay. Uh, Africa is the land of wide empty spaces. After being a Vinga Waina, the sand has never been red where I am from. No one has, no one has glanced at a reek and been reminded of the day I or high boreholes aren't called boreholes. They are just We are creating worlds when we make the waf. People lose their religiosity the same way they lose teeth. With some pain, but they're glad to be over with it. We don't pray on top of corpses. Corpses aren't corpses. Bodies sure. But we do not make them in elegant. We don't make death masks. We don't obsess over death. We don't wail. I wail. Our burials are mostly silent. They just are. My grandfather, well, the sand swallowed him. It was shockingly not red. Which was a shock to no one. I hoped it would flip orientalist momentarily. That the sand would also wound itself for him. It didn't even rain. Rain is blessings. How I long to be there to bury him in Nimra. A plastic water bottle on his grave site. Not grave. Just land that for a moment was a site and then wasn't. Portion not for the white gaze. Plastic is sacred too. In a place where things are not meant to last, it was like you weren't there at all. Let me bury you at least with plastic. To be made treasure, to be stolen, to be placed in a museum, later for some descendant to come across it, or and take it back home. Plastic and mechanisms of colonization as wayfinding, as path making, as conversation or fluke creating, as your eyes a whole swallowed star. To the indahage, hidig ben white as canvas before I destroy it, white as, white as, durhi dashagela. This is the site the elders sob to. There are no old worlds to return to, only new ones we swallow. Um, yeah, so basically for that one, it was really my first attempt at uh, trying to include Somali more. Um, and yeah, I suppose I was translating parts of it. Um, I ended up like translating it for the women as well. <laughs> and they really dragged me because 
because Somali poetry is like a really specific form and you're meant to like use alliteration. But I thought it was, um, yeah, I thought it was interesting I'm trying to think of sounds. Um, so this next one is called First Patient. I was half camel, half woman. I found myself coming unfurred. I never asked to be born. After my psychiatrist, brave beyond his years, tried to unhoof me, I ate his knee. Its entire self is so pitted it looked like the unseen moon side. Then, crying, he medicated me, as if that could begin to save me. I am past saving, always have been, and never asked to be born. The jellies of my umbilical cord are still pink and moist today. This is proof I should return to where my heart was born. Grave bitten land. Here, I am so dusty and hated. I bring reams of sand with me wherever I go. I pay for water in acacia leaves. I am perpetually dehydrated. Once treading the ground, I was cuffed and sedated. I slept for many blue weeks. I began to lose patches of my fur. People believed I was holy. How holy can I be when I drink cerulean pills? I have become unhooved. No one pretends to understand the languages I speak. I never asked to be born. None of my old friends exist. Yeah. So um, I guess the diaspora thing is a big is a big theme. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, okay. This next poem is called Nairobi, and I wrote it about Nairobi. Um, my mom tried to explain it to my grandmother, and she was really uh, angry. But it's because she didn't translate it correctly, so it's calm. Okay. Nairobi always smelt like the dryer sheets no one had the heart to use and mediocrity. It smelt like plastic if the sand ate the plastic. It smelt like me if I became plastic. It always smelt like corroded air vents, so now when the office heating fails, it smells like home. It smelt like cognitive dissonance, what my blackness meant in the quiet space, and also like a borderline that was washed and hung out to dry. It's more like artifice, if Africans are great at artifice, then all the natural things were artificial. You could see the seams and everything. Take, for example, the bottle-capped mosque I learned things at. Take, for example, the shop windows of big black people rolling their hips, a glass of hot tea pressing my uncle's ocular bone closed. I mean, when it was open, he would weep for days and I could never tell if that was because of me or because of the tear gas. It smelled like lollipops, fresh out of the wrapper, vinegar and grease scarring newspapers, tiny pieces of aluminum gum wrappers, not touching the ground, being pressed back into gums. Like the time you let chloride eat your eye and we all watched. Or the time you let chloride eat your eye and no one watched. I don't want to watch you anymore, me guarding the door, you teetering off the edge hoping to fly. You smell like cockroach wings buzzing against a mosquito net. Half a cockroach pressed between a door frame looks like your shadowed face. Sometimes mosquitoes don't keep anything out but love. Sometimes I woke up with love bites on my arms and they weren't mine. My, my uncle said I must have tasted like sugar water. You let the chloride on my skin sift onto your tongue. I was so acid I burnt. Nairobi smelt like my grandmother's shoulder, who I lay in bed with. She must have pretended I was hers and had never left her. I must have pretended I was hers and had never left her. People said I looked like my mother as a child, that my cheekbones floated through the sky like her. People held onto my wrists for too long for it to be kind. People thought I looked like my mother so much they called me Father Mon and not Asma. My grandmother and I slept like mother and daughter that night and the night after that, and the night after that. My mother said 30 days for each of the years she'd been gone. We slept each night like war had never happened. Sometimes you don't need a mosquito net, and somehow the only thing that is let in is love. When I woke up, love had not bitten me. When we went home, we were jeweled in eggs. So home smelt like cockroach wings, smelt burnt like grandmother, smelt like Nairobi. One egg for all the days we had been gone. Roaches that would live for lifetimes. War or not. Thanks. This is really odd. Just 
Okay. Do you, I'm gonna do, do... you want me to speak to you? Let me know. No, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going great, to do great. one last poem. Oh, everyone's clap. So, <laughs> <laughs> just, just keep silence. talking, Asma. Just silence. Okay, I'm going to do one last poem. This is a this is my attempt at a ghazal, which is like a form. Um, and yeah, should I describe the form? Who knows? So basically, you have to. <laughs> every second line has to have the same word. Yeah, and anyway, you'll see, you'll see essentially, you'll see there's some rhyme, and at the end, you have to mention yourself. So, um, doesn't have a title. However, God appears even in the ground that turns itself arid will be keen enough. I looked for heaven in the promised land holding sugar. Is this seen enough? Dear, dear, understanding God, your name is a snake biting on a tongue web. I coughed, and you were a spat out clot. Your prophet caught illiteracy, to you would he be enough. Your prophet a captured koi in Zamzam water. Your prophet your netted starfish. Your prophet a palm of sand, his disciples endless errors. To them will the Qur'an mean enough. To pray is only to give in to the endless. To pray is only to pry at the convex universe. Not all of us will go to the mountain. In your temple, how do we give in, God? Are we miskeen enough? My father in wudu, dragonfly to water, never spilling each perfect drop, gliding on his skin. In Ramadan, us living on date skins, turning towards you, God, are we lean enough? All this for what? A place in heaven. My ancestors left behind smaller gods to clutch your salt. We have drunk nothing but salt water since. Swallowed in their land, was their dean enough? Everyone I know will go to hedge. When the tower falls, accumulating souls, and they don't discard the carcasses, my parents pray they could die there too. Have they seen enough? Now I wait for the sun to rise and never think of praying. Parents at my door, Fajr has come, asthma. Fajr won't come again. But I'll wait for the ground to give in. Lord, I've fallen at your feet enough, or have I fallen at your feet enough? Um, yeah, it's from what I have at the moment, which is, uh, which is great, it's cool. Okay, so um, I suppose to wrap up, what am I doing at the moment? Um, or suppose, okay, very quickly, I think I I've always been writing poetry, um, but it was only really like after I left university, Oh, I suppose I dropped out of university that I started um, writing or um, trying to make it like my main thing and actually meeting meeting Ibrahim and um, all the others during the summer school was really inspiring because I saw how convicted they were to their craft and to being artists <clears throat> um, so yeah and uh, I, I also had a similar story as Ibrahim maybe is then I started writing for a magazine first of all um, and then started doing poetry started performing spoken word um, because Somali poetry is all so I thought I had to do that and um, yeah and then now I'm kind of moving more towards also including movement um, so I'm working with a a performance artists and uh, lots of other artists like choreographers and stuff um, and they're all like uh, black women from the diaspora um, so that's the production that Nelly mentioned earlier. Our rehearsals have been postponed because you know the uh, the world but um, yeah I'm really interested to see how um, yeah how like movement can also be added to that essentially so that is that is me i think maybe we can get into a is there a website for uh for the ma mail how do you pronounce it the, the mail if um i can link the website to you later for sure you for know. sure for sure okay yeah both we have the chat because you would have some questions probably popping in there. Oh, okay. 
Awesome. Should we go do that? Oh, that is so cute. <laughs> <laughs> How do you want to do this, uh, Ibrahim and Asla? Do you want to take some questions or are you? I was speaking without the microphone on. Uh, well, it's, it's you, you, you're the leader, the leader of the new school. Do, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> the new school, I don't know about the new school. But <laughs> yeah. so I guess maybe you could take some questions, maybe yeah. before we move to the next part. Um, everybody who wants to ask a question to Asma and Ibrahim, and it can be anything. Okay, we have one from Anna. Anna, are you here? Asma, are you open to collaborate? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, Asma, thank you very much. And Ibrahim, thank you too. It was very beautiful uh, beginning of the day. <laughs> and Asma, my question is about uh, using your uh, Poems uh, for uh, your poetry for singing. Is, are you open for that? Uh, do you consider to collaborate with some writers to uh, like uh, use your poems for the uh, inspiration for uh, creating music, sing songs? Thank you. Yeah, I think that'd be really um, awesome. Um, there's a there's a poet that we're going to be looking at later called Amiri Baraka and uh, one of the things I was really taken by was when he was um, he was performing alongside a jazz musician. I felt like it really fit very like beautifully together. So I just think it's yeah, it's very natural. And maybe can you both also talk about movement in your poems? Because you know they are both they are all working on this brief, which is about dance and revolution, and mm -hmm. so ultimately you mentioned it a bit, Ibrahim, when you were talking about water and the movement of water. And then I guess you're talking about it as well in your poems, um, you know, like the movement of you know whether it's love or whether it is of the diaspora and so forth, Asma. So I don't know how, and you mentioned that you're working with a choreographer now. Yeah, and I start, Ibrahim. Uh, well, uh, I, would, I would continue on what you said just now with uh, Amiri Baraka mm -hmm. and I think there is also yeah, Linton Kwesi Johnson who we, who we use, um, whose material we use and both, uh, I mean, Amiri Baraka used to be a musician and then he decided to do poetry but then um, he never left music. When, when you hear him talking, or when you read his texts, uh, there is always music in it, and it's beautiful. And then like Linton Kwesi Johnson same. I think his, his poetry is, is called dub poetry and he's like a reggae musician, he even signed to a label. And what the question of, uh, uh, I, I didn't get her name, sorry, but the question that was just asked. Uh, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I guess like, poetry and music. I mean, the thing is, okay, I'm a bit biased, but I believe that good music is poetry. And, and but that goes with everything where you have a dimension of poetry, in like anything, arts, cooking, whatever it would be, that makes it great almost. And when there is a lack of poetry, then there is a lack of life almost. Um, yeah, that's me. Yeah. Um, okay, so to return to your question, maybe movement and migration. Um, so yeah, as as you can tell, a lot of my work is about being in the diaspora and not being able to uh, return return back to the place where my parents are from, which I suppose is quite um, it's quite a boring subject because everyone everyone talks about it. Um, but yeah. Um, uh, and then also the choreographer. It's quite interesting because I I really just I I, well, I, I went to this performing art residency and I really just got involved because I wanted to try something new. Um, but I think I think it was um, I, I think when I ended up performing that Nairobi piece there, I ended up like um, when I was talking about my uncle's ocular bone being closed, I ended up rolling my hand over. So I guess like. 
it just it was whatever felt natural during the poem and I think I think with the two poets that um Ibrahim just mentioned is uh yeah their work feels very feels like it's it's coming out of them if that makes if that makes sense. So it's not really like a a premeditated thing and, and the choreographer I'm working with is very uh it's like whatever feels right in the moment and however you need to use your voice or your body to try and show to try and get get that thing across essentially and i think that's what um amir baraka does as well if you guys want to check him out um yeah you want to like write, you want to write his name as well inside the yeah i'll put it in the chat but it's about stretching um what's possible uh there's some more questions here yeah yeah go ahead I, you can call out for people as well to pop up on your screen Tong, I think, T H O N G. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want me to speak? Do you want to? Okay. Yeah, it's the H is silent, so you pronounced it correctly. Um, so uh, I just wondered, what's your uh, is your family's kind of relationship with your work? Seeing as you're kind of um, talking somewhat of your like intergenerational experiences and like relaying kind of experiences of your family to, you know, the context i i i i uh yeah <laughs> okay no, that was a really great question thanks for asking it um uh, my family their first language was not english it's somali so i think that's why i've been trying to move more towards uh, attempting to write in somali um but yeah i don't really share it with them uh, when i do try um it's usually just general concepts and themes because uh, my attempts at translating it are quite quite terrible but my dad always um appreciates it um appreciates what i'm trying to say even if it's quite um even even if it's talking a lot about intergenerational trauma or even their trauma actually and i think i think that's one thing that i've had to really consider is like how much um you know how much is um fair or not fair but you know how much is appropriate almost to put in and like who am i actually doing it for am i doing it for myself or am i doing it for the white gaze because there are certain things that um yeah that a certain audience really enjoys but then afterwards it's like was that actually for me can my people listen to that and not not feel pain, but I think, I think uh, it's a understandable thing exactly. So it's definitely a thing to consider. Thank you for asking that question. Um, do you have anything to say on that as well, Ibrahim? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I understood the question fully, to be honest. I think they're asking. Um, how your family, if your family has a relationship with your work, if uh, I, because I, I know that you spoke a bit about the diasporic experience earlier, I, but I, does I, that come I, across I, explicitly? Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> like, well, I would say for the the living family that I'm in contact with. So that's already like uh, training it the way. But then, uh, yeah, my mom, she knows for, for like since she was the one sending me to the library. But then when it was time to be a man and she was like, okay, now get, get yourself a job. I was like, no, I'm going to write. And she was like, are you sure? <laughs> and uh, she, then I was not necessarily sharing with her because the only thing you share is that you're broke and you can't make a living out of it. And then she's scared and like, there's, there's no point of passing this on her. So I was like very quiet and stuff, but the past, the past year, I was now very vocal, like, no, this is what I'm going to do. And, and like, like for me, it's very important to go, to be sort of transparent in, in fact, because 
uh, for years it was hindering even in the process of creating like if you cannot share with your direct family whilst talking about them or to them uh, although it can be painful actually but uh, if you do not I mean in my own in my own like, I can only talk for me but not doing it is hindering um, and uh, yeah they sometimes like she my mom I remember her laughing at her and being like yeah like certain things I've done and her saying, um, but actually what I'm trying to say is that it opened up an avenue to then talk to them in different terms. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't think you need me. You can just like <laughs> go through the question you want to pick. There is some more and there is some by Coco, Gaspar, you can just call them to appear. I want to, uh, can I, uh, I want to ask you uh, what do you feel when you're sharing your thoughts with others and also what is behind your, um, your creativity? I, I don't know if you, there is a sorrow, there is a, some kind of feeling that you, you, you can feel that you can change something with your art or what is behind it? Actually, um, when it comes to um, change and art, um, uh, I was watching um, a docu the docu is it a documentary or a film by Linton Quasey Johnson called Dread Beat Blood, which we have listed in our additional materials but um he said that poetry doesn't uh change anything it's just or to paraphrase and it's just a, a witness to the change and it's like the people that um through their material struggle bring about change so i think i think that's really how i feel i don't i don't really think that um i don't really think that the poetry is um, or uh, any art is, is possible. I mean, maybe it's controversial, but I don't think it's, it's possible to be like, this is what's going to heal and fix everything. But I do think it's a, a tool, as Ibrahim said when we were talking about this um, earlier. But um, yeah, whether it's the best tool, um, the most accessible tool is another question entirely. But yeah, I don't know. I do it because I, I like it. So it's really quite a self-indulgent thing. But I don't really pretend that it's going to change anything. What do you think, Ibrahim? Yeah, like you, I think it's there are limitations, but I would I would be a fool like powerful poetry. I mean poetry changed my life. So of course, I believe that people who are sensitive to to uh, words and storytelling, there's two things I'd say. One is the poetry that I was reading at school, but that was very boring and not talking to me and like like uh, romanticizing about flowers and things that don't really make sense, you know, and that we cultivate in the curriculum when there are things that are very present. That's not the poetry that talks to me, but that exists. So the poetry that talks to me changed my life. So I'm trying to do poetry that has the same sort of uh, cathartic effect and share it with the very people, like you said, that's my earlier, to who do I talk to? That question is the beginning, middle and end to every poem, like who do I talk to? And knowing this and sharing this with the people you think that might have a sort of um, understanding of it will change. And sometimes it's just, we we also have an idea of change as this over overall global like okay we switch like okay on and off like but i think change is can be very little as us like listening to asma poem and feeling like that was beautiful and then it's like that's enough like the change is there then my day is my perspective already changed and that in itself is, is it's enough mm, yeah and maybe to contradict myself, <laughs> um, I was reading up on these really cool 
uh, Somali women poets back in Somalia who um, hijacked uh, radio systems and transmitted like uh, liberation poetry during the time of um, colonization and that was so radical because uh, ordinarily women's poetry is not really prized and put forward it's kind of seems like a casual thing um, so yeah and, and there's not really like much left of that it's just a few fragments that have been saved um, do you want to Andrana do you want to ask your question hey can you hear me hi yes I'm from Cyprus. Mm -hmm. um yeah so basically it's just like in the moment when you have hey guys I'm super proud of you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, okay, so yeah, in the moment when you're like writing or trying to describe that one, that one feeling, and you get stuck on a word that describes it really well but doesn't flow with the rhythm, what do you do to find the way? You know, because nah. Asma, you've gone. Am I still here? Can people hear me? Yeah, I'm muting myself because I was a truck. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, what process did I see? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, so actually i found um when i was trying to write in somali that it was easier to think about rhythm and sounds because i'm more unfamiliar with that language even if it's um not sort of grammatically there but um i think i think i usually when it comes to writing i usually do free writing which is when i when you like force yourself to write Non stop for however many minutes, and then that generates all the material. And then I will read it out and record myself reading, um, listen back to that, and then change accordingly. So I guess that's how I, I, I actually do it. And then not getting stuck on words. I think, again, maybe quite. I think I think again what saves me is maybe using other other languages um, and I think um, attempting to do like an imperfect translation like a lot of poetry can also come from that like for example there's this Iranian American poet who is called Kaveh Akbar and he has a poem called Do You Speak Persian um, and yeah, I think it's like because he he says "Salam um, which is "I miss you," but then he uses it like again and again to mean different things throughout the poem. So I feel like I feel like I kind of get away with a lot by using other languages, and all of the all of the gaps in between where they don't really meet is is where I try and make things work. You know, yeah. How about you, Ibrahim? Uh, well, the two, I will, I will be concise, but it's like two sort of way answer. One, Andriana, uh, who just asked the question, was with us in New York yeah. last summer. Uh, and uh, we did a, like a sort of weird essay video together. That's also a poem, but we wrote it together. So in the process of us doing this, the idea was actually not to get stuck and because we didn't have time it's that if you get stuck then it's not okay you should just carry on doing things and i think that goes back to the idea of asma saying she free writes basically you do not get stuck you just have to carry on going and then you then you you you, you sort of pick what's best and you you build from that and um and on that note uh, we were also saying uh, with Asma a few days ago that good poetry actually uh, sort of bypasses the the sometimes the the the, the sort of visual no no, no the sort of uh, audible effects or the wordplay 
that is actually the easiest part in the poem for the sake of the meaning. So sometimes you have to, you have to um, sort of sacrifice the words for the sake of keeping the meaning, which is the most important. So it's like, okay, that word was the sort of uh, anchor to everything, but can I say the same in a different way? And, and does it does the same work? If so, then the word was not that important. Um, yeah, and sometimes you can uh, leave it or write around it. Like the topic yeah. of my grandfather, I've written so much about that, and most of it is terrible because it's kind of hard to address. Um, Zana, do you want to ask your question? Or maybe I can read it out. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, oh, you're here. Are you here? Mm -hmm. Yes. So show your face. Uh, you don't have to, just. <laughs> <laughs> hi everyone so, hi everyone can you guys hear me yeah they just can't reply okay my question uh was uh to ibrahim and um asma which was um do you think the intentions behind the poetry affect how the poetry manifests and lives in the physical world so the intentions that the poet has how what role do they have in the manifestation of how the poetry lives and manifests itself in the physical world, which is a question on impact and um, the impact of poetry in real life. What can I ask? What do you what do you imply by intentions? Uh, for instance, for if you are writing a poem about being you know, in the diaspora and you experience there, the intentions that you set when you write, is it more of an expressive thing of what you're feeling and living, or is it more like an imagined reality in terms of that? So then is it more about what is currently happening in the physical space or more about what you wish to happen in the space that you're in? Uh, does I think that make sense? I think, I think maybe like in a, practical sense perhaps like for me there's a difference between spoken word and written poetry there are a lot of trucks um so i'm just gonna... <laughs> oh damn okay wait um i find when i write a spoken word poem that it's um, a lot longer, um, it usually has like more repetition or a returning back to the same ideas and I think that's because I'm thinking about how um, it will be performed and how I'm kind of guiding the audience along with me um, and then as opposed to something I think that will just exist on the page, usually it's like I kind of cut out, try and cut out all the extraneous sentences and think more about how um, it will appear. Yeah, and, and maybe I play around more with certain images because, because it's going to be right. But really like the two are interchangeable and I think that's, that's the type of poetry that I think um, your, your intention changes how it ends up existing. Um, yeah, what do you think, Ibrahim? Again, I just tell me, Zana, if I don't answer the question, I will mm -hmm. answer with what I understood. Um, but yeah, the intention, I guess, me for me, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting older, I realized that when I was younger, the intention was always outside, like it was always like outside in, like. I see something, I talk about it, and now it's more the, it's the opposite. It's like, I, li I actually inhabit a state and I speak about that state into its manifestation. So, but it's a bit, but that 
thinking sometimes um, keeps me from writing because there is a, it's almost like uh, they I forgot who who mentioned that but um, and I'm paraphrasing very badly but uh, I think it was saying that writing writing is a lie and speaking is half a truth but everything else is just inside it's like by the time you're already expressing it it's no longer the pure thing that you deem um, uh, or you kind of witness so there is something weird uh, in the intention actually um, but I guess the ultimate one is for myself to keep a sort of archive of something I've experienced uh, and when I say something is a state again a, a mindset or state yeah so maybe, and I, okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, please and, go ahead. Okay, and I guess also it's maybe thinking about your audience perhaps beforehand. For me, hinders the writing is it's easier to just write as if it's private. But yeah, um, what did you want to say, Nelly? Well, I was going to say maybe uh, let's take the last question and then move into your workshop section, no? Because you want them to also produce some poet. poet yeah. Um, so, I might be butchering your name, but Shaya Kamili. Kamili, actually. Ha, ha, how do you say it? Kamili. I Shamili. Think, okay. I, I mean, I hope I'm saying it right this time. Shamili, are you here? Yeah, it's um, yeah, Shamili. Um, okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask about... Um, yeah, I really liked what you were saying about um, interviewing um, the elders in your family and like kind of into the um kind of your poetry kind of going alongside it um i really like that project and yeah i hope to like i'd love to hear more about it sometime as well um yeah i was just kind of echoing that other question the question that was just before kind of about how poetry has been like usually it's been um disseminated through writing and how that's usually how it's read like how people have usually accessed poetry is through its written form. Um, but is, do you think that, I think maybe like now, nowadays with our culture of like attention spans being quite short and um, people not really um, wanting to spend a lot of time kind of um, accessing it in the, in the moment, do you think that it's now forced to be the case that it has to be there has to be a performance element or some kind of a sound element or movement element for it to be relevant for the future? Well, that's a really great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I don't think it has to be forced, but I think there is something true about um, with something that Quizzy, the poet Quizzy said, um, that spoken word has like an immediacy um, and I feel like the same can be said for music or, or film um, and other things that um, can be, I don't know, that can sort of reach more people because I feel like, I feel like um, with Somali poetry usually uh, the poet writes it and then a singer sings it and they repeat uh, each line or each verse twice so that people remember it and I feel like there's something really great about the um, oral tradition and, and it kind of equalizes poetry so that it's like every day anyone can do it um, yeah and it's like amongst the public rather than it being like a more elitist thing and I, I, yeah I, I do think that sometimes writing is not sometimes I think I think it is like a barrier to entry basically but I don't I don't think it has to be done I don't think you should force it but I do think it's really important to have spoken word and other stuff yeah what do you think Ibrahim uh, it's I think uh, I'm, I'm not a I'm not like a a diehard like observer of poetry and tendencies and stuff like that so I, I cannot say 
but uh, in general, yeah, like if, if you talk about like media and the way we sort of digest it, it's always you can almost like market uh, poetry easy easily um, in like let's say short and uh, visual. And when I say visual, I include sound somehow, uh, content than if it's written. But then uh, I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't really say and make statements like that. It's there is, there is like foods for every taste, and it's just for us to find what we like. And and there is like millions of um, pockets of. Uh, Community is doing different things, and I don't, I don't see, I don't see actually an homogene like uh, sort of poetry words. I don't see that. It's like everything happens simultaneously, and you have actually hybridization. Hybridization. I don't know if I do it properly, but people do their own stuff and they mix uh, mediums, and 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 that's great. And I'm not so. Um, sad about anything changing for you. Okay, so maybe we can move to the second part, which is, um, so now you have 35 people onto the line. Some are visiting participants, some are the researcher, like you were when you were in New York. So I guess the question for you is, do you want to keep on with the 35 or do you want to kind of shrink it to the 16? How do you want to play this? For you? Whoever wants to stay, stay. <laughs> what, what do you think, Asuna? I agree, I agree. If you want to stay, stay. So that's, th that's said. Now, what do you want to, do you want to like run them through the plan and when you, because what I'm going to do now is to make you the host. So either Ibrahim or Asma, whichever you, whoever you prefer. Uh, and then that means that I'm leaving and I'm leaving you kind of leading the, the way that you want to get people in and out. And I guess you wanted to have them back here anywhere at two, am I correct? Or three, I always get this up, three to five. Because they need to have some time to write. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Ibrahim, do you want to be the host? I feel like no, it, does, it doesn't matter. Maybe run them through what the plan is and then and also let me know because I would love to listen to the poems for what time I need to come back. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be looking at um, different poems that we've picked out and also some performances and then we're going to be responding to prompts and trying to generate some material which you guys can then um, yeah, go ahead and work on independently in the break and when we come back, we can share and hear what you've made. Uh, if, I, just, I just literally need to use the loo and I come back. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, please go to the loo. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe Asma can, can run the, the plan. So like I'm leaving. Like I guess what you. But I'm just gonna pee. Don't worry. But uh, Asma, you can just. <laughs> yeah, we introduce what we're gonna do. But that's fine. Everyone can do. It.